it's time to talk about the ETC slash WTC slash European Team Championships, World Team Championships. And I'm sorry for everybody's OCD, but I did try to make a separate window here. And I know that Matt is slightly off centered with us. And it's upsetting me, let alone you guys. So I know my, my failings and I strive to do better in the future. Gentlemen. That's right. Hello, everybody. It's uh, time to start a what is going to be a long running series on the WTC, the World Team Championship team format, which, uh, if you don't know, is a hugely huge like team based tournament that is country on country. It's like the World Cup. It oh, is Warhammer amazing. Yeah, it's my if favorite. You've never tournament. heard of it. You're about to learn a lot. Yeah. Yep. We've got stuff. So we've we haven't had an event for a while, guys. I haven't been uh, I haven't been able to travel over, and it makes me sad. I've already got my Sweden trip planned, where we, we oh, use, no. well we do the we do we do justice over there because we practice. Because as everyone, if, if you haven't traveled, team event plays a lot different, and different places play a lot different. Forty k, so it's amazing to get that feel for different countries and team events themselves because the play is so much different. It's why I love team events so much because you're playing for points and you're yeah. playing for the team. So you're not just trying to max yours and, and move on with yours. There's so much strategy that goes into it. hundred percent. Now in today's video, we're going to be discussing what the WTC is, how uh, countries pick their teams. We're going to go over the history of some of the WTC and what countries have historically come out on top and give you a better understanding of what this whole series is going to break down so that you learn more about team events, more about different metas that exist out there, and like a whole culture around the team-based format of the eight-person WTC event. Now, other countries have sort of taken that format and do like five team tournaments like the ATC and the Canhammer Team Tournament and other events like that. But uh, eight-person teams is sort of like the high standard for like world class team tournaments. And it, and it makes a big difference on that too. The five five teams is our standard because you look usually get that many of your mates together is tough in the first place. But the team itself, when you get into eight, it becomes one we only use one book per team. So you have to come up with eight completely different armies. And yeah. one book per player per team, not one book per health team. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> We're just one one book. You just choose a book and we just do that. That would that, that would be terrible. So uh, there you go, Matt. Good to have you, buddy. But um, so you end up having some weaker lists, and you have skew lists, and you can actually get into pairings that try to f steal, basically capture one of those lists into a bad matchup. Because you're most of the time you're doing those pairings, you're actually not so much looking for your good pairings; you're looking for your not bad pairings. And there's lots of strategy that goes into this. Let's talk about the history, though. Matt made this beautiful thing for us. So we started off yeah. in 2007 in Switzerland. That's right. I mean, I, I'm so upset about, ugh, screw you, COVID. Because 2019, <laughs> we had 36 teams, but mm -hmm. Neil and Peter, I want to say everybody, Tom, that's doing such a great job with the WTC, we were looking to have, in 2020, 40-plus easy teams because we were bringing in uh, a lot of teams from Asia that were going to come in. Uh, yep, more and yeah. more people that was coming. So exciting. Yeah, I mean, it, and it's just it was ready to explode, and then we had, um, well, a little bit of a, a bump in the road. I don't know if you guys heard about it. It was called COVID. <laughs> uh, almost a three-year bump. Yeah, let's, uh, yeah. you know, uh, but it's exciting. It's going to be back this year. So, uh, Matt, you you've been. I mean, well, Matt and Brad, both of you have been part of the ETC slash WTC scene a lot longer than I have been, you know, uh, being members of your own like respective countries, teams, and even like mercenaries or things like that. So, you know, what is just the WTC in a nutshell in like two sentences uh, that you would explain to someone who's in the war room or who's just learning about team events? Um, like, how would you describe it? I'm going to let so, that start and then I'm going to put some mojo on it. I would say it's every year the most sporting, highest level competitive event in the world. I head and shoulders above everything that I've been to anywhere else. And the team aspect of it just makes it so much more fun because you're there with a group of mates with probably like 10, 12 of you, 
a lot of the time because you don't just go with your team of eight. You take your coach, your water boy, your ninth man, your harem of just people along with you. <laughs> and it's just a fantastic time because everyone's there. No matter what country, they've got the same thing in common. And you can go and chat with anyone and have nothing in common apart from 40K. So everyone's got something. Yeah, I'll say everybody has something that they will even talk about. I love the fact that you've got team event one because every round is like a brand new tournament because it doesn't matter if you got a maximum, got a zero, the next round yeah. you have to completely rejuvenate yourself and it's fully new. Boom. You have to score points for your team. The second thing is, is that I love the WTC because it's literally the world team championships, but they put such an emphasis on sportsmanship and it's judged and it's judged harshly. If you try to be a non-sportsman, uh, you can actually get huge penalties, uh, lose games, specifically if you try to do shenanigans. And I kind of wish that they would do that more um, in everywhere else. You know what I mean? I, I really like the yeah. idea of just, hey, don't be an a-hole or you're just going to lose games. You know what I mean? Is they do a lot of stuff with that on intent. I mean, it's your job to make sure that your opponent's reserves come in, for instance. You get yep. penalized yep. if you don't. And that's just one yep. one such thing. So, so we have a well. we have we have a, a a list of all of the different countries that this is well all of the different teams that have historically done really well since the beginning of the event in two thousand and seven. Is that correct? Yeah, all the way to two thousand and eighteen. We got yeah. some like there's a, a a slide where we can actually go and there. You know, there's some there are some countries that you see quite frequently and it just comes to show in a lot of these countries the WTC and the style of tournament that team based uh differential scoring which we will discuss as the the events go it's all part of like the culture of like TOs doing events and playing games where you know uh, Matt you and I were talking the other day how players will for their country's sake to do well at the WTC, sacrifice their singles scoring like and standing to like practice with say an underused faction just to gain an advantage at the WTC specifically. And it's like it's a it's a thing that a lot of countries take much more seriously than has historically been the case in like in the US and Canada, for example. My rule for me was that after LVO, I didn't play anything that wasn't going to be my WTC list until that, yeah. that was over. <clears throat> yeah, I'm normally the same. As soon as the team's picked, and we kind of go, "Cool, who, who's playing what? We know what armies we're using. I'll stick with one thing from now until August, and then I'll have August to January, roughly something like that, where I'll just go all wild and wacky and use <laughs> things, and just get that out my system." But... Mm -hmm. I forgot how unbelievably hardcore the Germans have always taken the team. Yep, and I think it translates a huge. I mean, obviously, you can see the results here. They've won multiple times. I think they won five times. Yes, one, two, three. Yep. Yeah, um, Polish as well. Yeah. Poland, Poland, I think, huge. is the most winning Poland, team right. at the WTC, like at ETC WTC. So, the the thing about both of those teams is they also play in their countries very, very on what their team's going to be, that the team list is going to be. And I think you guys have. I mean, you're the reigning champions right now in England. Uh, and I think the years that your everything changed for you guys a few years ago when most of your top players really just started to embrace only bringing things that they would really play at the team championship too. Yeah, it's a lot of it. You, you kind of got to take your ego out of it because you might have a team of eight players who you can go to a singles event and any one of the eight could win that event. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden, if you're looking at a team, you can't have eight people playing Tau or eight people playing Nids or eight Eldar. You might have one person on Necrons, one on Guard, one on whatever, and you go, okay, you've just got to play every single game. And you go into those events knowing, I could win this if I bring Army A, but now I'm going to make this year's focus, uh, this team event in three, four months time, and just sacrifice all my singles. And it's huge you on that. You go out of it. It's a big thing on that. I think that we didn't start doing well. America took a long time to adapt that 
And uh, one of the slides here is basically across the years, many teams have used different methods for selection, varying from rankings, qualifying events, captain's choice. We used to have a very convoluted way of getting people on the team. But what happened is you got five chaos players, five Eldar players kind of thing, because people yeah. qualify with the same thing. Yeah. And that yeah. happens is that they get split up to armies that they're not very versed in, very experienced with. So you went into the event with all these people that were very, very good with one army, not getting to play that army. And Well, uh, around the world, you know, Germany, Poland, uh, uh, Sweden, you know, England, uh, the U.S., even Canada, you know, we, we all have very different ways of picking yeah. a team. And that's a, one of the things that we wanted to kind of highlight today was kind of going over some of the ways teams pick those, like get picked. You know, I think the only sort of like thing that is, I guess, a standard is in the WTC, TC, each team has a captain. And the captain acts as sort of like an administrative link between like the council of captains, which is where a lot of the sort of like um, FAQ choices and votes happen on behalf of the team. And that's sort of like the voice of the team in sort of like a council of teams, if that makes sense, um, as well as some countries uh, give the captain a lot of power in team selection. And then some countries, it's a little different, right? So I think we've had we had a couple that we wanted to highlight, including our three countries here. You know, but Matt, which one do you think we should go over first? I think we should go over Brad's um, <laughs> the USA because, like you were saying, then they've changed massively Com from going yeah, hugely. We have, we've won this event, this event, this event, this event. Cool, we've got four Eldar players on the team. Yep, and now we have Emperor Naden, and he just said, "I'm picking the team. Deal with it." <laughs> And, and it showed the first year you did it. As well. Yeah, we, we started yep. Maiden's first year. We immediately won. And I think that's a big deal because we, we for a change, got to pick people based on armies, what we needed for the team itself. Because there's a difference between just being the best player and being the best player with Chaos, with GSC, yep. which whatever you want to have on the team, and you get that person on. And there's also a big deal on, hey, are these people going to be fun people to work with because you got to talk to them for six months you know what i mean back and forth financially as well it's yeah big, especially for you guys it's, yeah, more it's huge on us people. we have mm -hmm. so many people that so, would like to go that uh oh probably can't go <laughs> yep when you guys are looking at picking your team then and sean's getting the final say i'm sure other people have input but if people did want to get involved and see oh maybe i want to put myself forward is there a way people can I'd reach out to you guys. 100%. And... We have a Team USA Facebook. We have a Team USA Discord. Um, you can obviously talk to members of the team on the in just any event that we go to. I mean, people consistently, uh, Sean loves to make the fun of it that uh, he calls me the voice of the emperor so that I have to go talk to people and then I tell him about what they say <laughs> and then he decides to do what he was what he will with this information. So, but it's just putting it out and making yourself available and being being willing to be a faction expert is kind of one of the big things too is willing yep. everybody's willing to play the, the bandwagon but i've went to nine etcs and i've played eight different armies so i just play whatever people want me to play and i just stick with it for that half year so you have to that's just something that you're going to do and it might actually be like matt was saying earlier it is a little bit of an ego kick though because you're possibly spending half the year not playing the best thing you know what i mean you're playing what you're going to be playing for the team and that really gets you on the team showing that you're willing to do that will get you a hundred percent more check marks of you getting looked at to be on that mm -hmm. team for sure i think there's something to said uh something to be said about consistency in like scoring points and like rankings with like certain factions and you know you're not always like some countries will you'll get to kind of like pick or have like top players in the rankings sort of pick other players you know and each country is different as we were saying and before as you were saying the states was very much like that if you won certain events you sort of like got selected to go to the team but that ended up leaving like at the top of the meta when eldar was good everybody would win with eldar and then you had five eldar players or whatever or you know five yeah. like core it, players or it got just super fun. weird 100 yeah. we had great Correct. You know, everything they want how are you guys picking the team now matt because you guys have changed uh over the years also yeah so if you go back maybe 10 years i think they used to have a like a uk rankings before itc and all that and it used to be 
you could pick from the top couple of there and whoever was captain was the captain and then they get two out of the top three i think and then it scales down and down but they've done away with that years and years ago yeah and at this point it's just uh the captain's choice so it's been slightly different the last couple of years because we've got two captains in josh and tony who are both kind of doing their own bits and pieces and then it's everyone applies whoever wants to from you've been to one event you've been to 100 events everyone gets a little, little phone call a little spreadsheet to fill in just to introduce themselves to the team yeah uh, that gets trimmed uh, this year and last year to a top 16 and then this year i was chosen uh, quite early on as one of the players so the three of us had a lot of kind of discussions back and forth and trimmed the 16 down to an eight and then the eight down to the team as it is now. What's going on in the, the, the great North? Well, Canada, you know, we settle everything by moose wrestling. <laughs> uh, you have to wrangle a, a moose uh, while doused in maple syrup and dressed like a beaver. And then, I've seen you the know, videos. There you go. Exactly. That's and then the strongest survive and we make a team. To be honest, uh, t uh, Team Canada over the last, I want to say, four years has had a huge transformation in how to pick a team. And you know, it's very funny because some countries are very particular. They'll have like individual teams, sort of like win the team spot with a team, which we'll get to you know in a second. France, but, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. But uh, in Canada, it used to be sort of like team captain picked a team. Right. And and uh, and it was more of a casual sort of thing. But over the last four years, the team has sort of adapted into a very, I want to say, like sports team style is what I'd want to call it, where we open applications to everybody who wants to come in. And so if you're in Canada and, and you ever want to you know, participate in the selection process, you can apply to be a part of the team. Um, then we have sort of like a couple of months of sort of like filtering out, you know, serious applicants from just applicants who, you know, just wanted to apply uh, uh, to get their name out there or whatever. And we we then trim the team down to sort of like a we have over the course of that trimmed the, the main team down to a 16 squad with a couple of coaches, which is like 18 players. Um, or 18 people who play. And that has allowed us to do internal scrimmages on TTS, which is eight on eight, and allowed us to sort of, you know, play uh, different countries and sort of switch out the eight that we wanted to represent the country and see like different lists and different players. And then uh, usually it's been the captain and, and assistant captain. Um, uh, so myself and Chris, we both sort of selected a third person and then the three of us would select the next person and then the four would then select the next person and then the five would select the next. And we've trimmed it down from that pool, like that squad, which is the team. So everybody who makes the squad is essentially a member of the team. And then from that, we've selected a traveling team, right? The eight players that will go and play as well as a coach and, you know, and, uh, and like substitutes as well, if anything would happen. So like a sports team. So that's kind of how Team Canada has been doing it uh, as of late. And we're really excited to sort of, like you know, that. show the fruit, the effort of, of what we've done. So you had brought up rankings on the thing and a couple of the teams we will just use France, for instance, are huge on their actual rankings. And they yeah. specifically get people from those rankings that are automatically on the team. And then you've got other teams that do a little bit of a, a mashup of that. Like, for instance, Sweden does you can pick they have a ranking system they have a pretty active ranking system too internally within sweden that they can you have to choose people from i can't remember if it was top eight top ten and the captain chooses people from there and then they have i think two captain's picks one or two captain's picks so everybody has like a little bit different i like the fact that we all have different methods of getting there yeah i think the french and the italians they're quite interesting because what they do is they have little team events so i know the italians had theirs uh, within the last couple of months and basically the winning team got to be the core of the yeah the eight so the team of four won it they're now the core of the team france do it i'm not entirely sure on the details but the way france do it is they have three different divisions of teams like uh, a b c and groups can go up and down within those divisions 
and then the part of the top team of the top division gets to be the core of the team. But yeah, I think they are they're hard core bit. on that too with their rankings oh, yeah. of it. It's just a good stuff. So let's talk about the format itself for everybody that has never actually been in a team tournament. So what happens is Captain Matt and Captain Scarry go out. And when each of them puts out one army and they put a face down and they flip up, they show the person and then they each one chooses two of their armies to attack. And the defender gets to choose which one, which one he wants to play. And then the other one gets refused and put back in the pool. And that basically continues that process until the end where the very last pairings where the two refused armies will play each other. And then you have kind of one left over, what I like to call the scrum, where yep. if, if you haven't been paying attention, you could get some armies that are bad news bears versus each other. So, which is yep. why it's such a big deal to what we, I think every single team has and it get, you get yourself into trouble, which is everyone has a matrix, which says, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm green versus I'm good versus Scary. I'm terrible versus Matt. And I'm okay versus my, my own army kind of thing. And it's yeah. so very, very dependent that you, and people get these right. Cause I can't tell you, I've been to nine of these. And yep. when oh, you go to huge. do the pairings and you start to do the pairings and you're talking with your team and you're like, Hey, you said you get a 15 versus Scary's Dark Eldar. And, he, and then you talk to the person at the event and they're like, no, I can't play that on this mission. And you're like, what? Yeah, I actually get a three. And you're just ready to put it out and go, oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I've wow. tested this. I just didn't put it in the Matrix. And it's funny because in terms of format, like, each team or each country will have a different way of practicing or developing, like, the the knowledge of the pairings but because you only get one codex per player per person in a team on on in normally you know unless of course they like faq say harlequins and eldar which i've seen yeah. but like space marines are a one codex right yeah. and then all of the different space marine supplements you could play but you only get one space marine player you only get one you know chaos space marine player you get one thousand suns one death guard one knight you know one eldar right that has like harlequins at least in wtc so your personal intrinsic knowledge of how your list does into other factions is massively important especially on missions and with different styles of terrain it's okay for you to lose or to know that you are going to lose it's more important to know how by how much right 100 percent. because then it helps yeah. or by how much you think you can win or if you can if you can put pressure on your opponent to win by bigger numbers rather than just uh winning and yeah. i think that's like one of the biggest differences in terms of format between a singles event at an itc and like a like a team event because you're not just trying to win or lose you're trying to win and win big to to increase the differential which will get and, and or lose small that, and or lose yeah. small, that, that right? guy like, might be the exactly. best person on the team that guy that goes out 100%. and takes out the the harlequins the towel the whatever the yeah. boogeyman is that they're trying to get those big right. spreads and you could lose all your games but if you barely lost all your games by very little differential you might be the whole exactly. reason the team wins 100 so, yeah That's it's too, a crazy like, mindset exactly as well and, and so, like, you're looking at ITC, like, if you're playing in an ITC singles super major, you win by one point, doesn't matter, you, you win, and you go to the next round. In an ETC, WTC format, that's super important to know that, like, if you win within or lose within a range of five victory points, you're, you're tying your opponent. Yeah, and that, a tie. that might be considered a loss. I can't, my first, Correct. my first... Yeah. ATC, I went to, we played Poland, and I got a draw, and the guy had played so different. I was completely unready for it, European style, you know, in that team championship, mm -hmm. and he yep. never moved a model more than two bases off the board edge, and yep. this is with varying game length, and the game ended on five, and the next turn, I was just going to table him, but on that turn... It was 10, 10 and he literally jumped up and cheered. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what's happening, man. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like, it's <laughs> really strange. It's really difficult when you're playing against someone and they're not trying to win the game. 
nope. they're just trying not to lose by as much as possible. So if you're playing a singles game and it's a bad matchup for you, you might have to take risks and you might have to do some random chance and just go for it. And if it doesn't pay off, oh, well, you're probably losing it anyway. But if you're in a team set up, you're not going to do that. You're not going to take those chances. You're just going to sit and go, okay, I'll lose. I'm trying to beat someone who, by more, who's tr not trying to take those chances, not trying to win. That can be really interesting. It's a completely different dynamic in the game. Oh, it's, it, it, the thing is, it's so hard for people that have never been. I'm talking to the boys now, all the Outer War boys. A lot of them are on the team this year. And we're talking about it because you was, you make assumptions to how your, your opponent's going to play. Mm -hmm. Because yep. it, to win the game, you have to go out and take that middle objective. You have to go out and get this. Well, if you're not worried about winning, you're just worried about not losing by much. You don't do any of that. You can just yep. sit on your two objectives with all 2,000 points of your army and do nothing. And you're like, yeah, yeah. but you're always going to lose. You're like, yeah, cool. <laughs> you're like, that, that's what I'm it's supposed to do. Exactly. Because, yeah. you know, if you only get a 12-8, your opponent gets a 12-8 win, and that's the army that they were banking on to get that 20-0 with, you yeah. know, that it smashes so hard, you we're again mvp of the art and the team but it's also i really like to go in because i like to say why it's enjoyable in sportsmanship here uh for the team event because it takes a different mindset because everybody goes in with their huge ego because everybody that's on the team is somebody that's won many tournaments and stuff before it's tough to know that you are going to probably take multiple losses over the course of the weekend oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah but that's You're that's kind of like the whole yeah, that's that's kind of like the whole point. Like they, this weekend, I just came back from the Can Hammer team tournament, and it's the same in like when you're playing with differentials. I got paired into Dark Harlequins for one of our toughest rounds, and my job was just not to lose by a lot. And I was able to squeeze eight out of the twenty points out of this matchup, knowing that Dark Harlequins right now, for example, are one of the armies that can just completely crush you, right? So. It was like almost it was very satisfying, even though that game was lost in in terms of like points to not let the Harlequins get away with like a giant point differential. That's what I find very enjoyable about the, the whole team process is you can lose your game. But if that helps your team win, it's massively important. I mean, game one of the year that we won. Um... I had the misfortune. We took I took a jank. Well, my army was a defender type army. I played Chaos Horde and I played punisher tanks and a bunch of other stuff that was just going to kill me over the eventual at uh, the end of it but i was just trying to take points so i played for points ground out points and i died on five was just slightly or sorry one on five uh, tied on six and the game kept going sadly and on seven i got one point and i had to fight for that one point however we won that round by one point <laughs> so I played a completely defensive game, just trying to points, points, you know, the entire time. And it's funny because just, we talk about that, but it's so big of a deal because in any tournament you go to, you're in England, you're in the Americas, you're anywhere. People are trying to win the game if it's not a team tournament. Yeah. And if you haven't played teams, it is just a quick mind blast when all of a sudden your opponent does absolutely F all. You know what I mean? They're like, go. <laughs> you're like, yeah. what? Go. We, I'm going to hide behind yeah. these walls. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, We try and take a new player every year on the England team. So we've had like fresh face every last year. And trying to get that mindset into him or before the event. It's like we took uh, Mike last time we went and he came back from it going, okay, yep. <laughs> it's oh, wow it's yeah. so okay. different we, we we've had the good pleasure thank you swedes everybody up there they, they host us a lot of the years we've come up there and we do a boot camp have uh, you been over there uh but we play we drink too much we play a lot of 40k but it gets people into that mindset you know we play a bunch of team games we pay we literally pair um sometimes we'll play the opponents you know that they want to play something back and forth and we'll act, do actual pairings and play play multiple games try to get your matchups that you're you're not 100 percent sure on and a lot of times it gives us so much not only does it get everybody in that mindset of yeah. just trying to get points sometimes but it also i love it because everybody has a different view of that england canada america 
a lot of times you'll have your matrix and you look at it and both of us have completely different thoughts about certain matches. And then you play them with different people and you get a different a view. And it's nice to see other people's viewpoints because everybody that you've been playing usually gets down to that one. We all kind of agree that this is the case. But then you go to Canada, you go to England, we start practicing and they go, oh, you guys think this? Well, why do you think this? And then you, you you play out the game and you're like, you could do, you know, this. You could be very aggressive or you could be very passive. And I, I love, I don't know, I just, I love the difference in the play and everything else that comes with it. That's why team events are, are laughably by far my favorite. That's all I played this year, too. I've only been playing team events. Because yeah. uh, it's hard to go back, to tell you the truth. I like singles. I'm never going to, probably never just completely bang singles. But once you start playing team events, you, you have your friends, your, your mates are there, you're, you're playing for them. You can never just throw in the towel. If you're getting crushed right now in a singles event, you kind of put it on autopilot and, you yeah. know, you go. No, in a team event, you you play till the last to get those all of the points that you can possibly get. <laughs> if I could just do team events for an entire year, I would happily just do team events. Same, 100%. Like, there's, there's something to be said about it also vibing really well with the team. You know what I mean? Like if you find a team that just that the whole team connects so well, it's like any sort of sports team, like they tend to do 10 times better if the the connection between everybody on the team is like just clicks really well. And and something to be said is I find that a team like especially at the WTC, like the aim is to go have fun, like play hard, but you do it in like a very sportsmanlike way, you know, and I know that the entire WTC um, like judging stuff, right? And the refs, like the ref stuff, has especially Neil has really pushed towards making it turned it around just so a, hard. Exactly, yeah. not just a premier event for competitive hard play where you're grinding every single point in a game, but also with the right spirit, right? And I think that's it's very important to understand that it might sound very overwhelming, but the framework is there to make sure it is a very enjoyable experience no matter yeah. how tough the game is exactly at high levels i do want to no i want to answer this question real quick because uh, it's something that the wtc does and i wish that we would do it in every tournament uh bjorn says you know 50 millimeter bases can't stage to the into the building uh actually the wtc plays it so that if you could make the charge you just count as making the charge and so i think he's talking about uh the fa floor with a Wobbly model. Oh, the wobbly model. So, well, they also have we that. We will have that, topic. I was about to say, that also is a WTC rule that I also enjoy, is that you can't stop people from getting to that second floor. They, they consider that a thing, too. Yeah, so, so we will touch on a load of the other as, as, uh, as we go. FAQ things in one of the future, because we're going to do, I think there's about 12 of these scheduled in. So yeah, yeah right we're going to have one a week right now. Uh, make sure you stay tuned to the War Room, where we'll be doing these on a consistent basis. And we'll be discussing a huge range of topics um, based around the WTC. So if you want to learn more, you want to dive in, and really kind of sink your teeth into the format and what it entails, um, especially if you're thinking of going to like even the ATC or the Canhammer Team Tournament or any other big team event around the world, uh, we'll, be, we'll be really squeezing the juice out of this one. I also put the link up in for the World Team Championship site. And the fact that what we're going to do is we're going to do exactly that. We have a delightful slide that says that we're going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a big deal on this. And everybody that hasn't been to a team event, and I, I know we talk, I talk about teams quite a bit when I talk about clinics and stuff like that, because it also doesn't matter what the meta is right now. Even when the meta's at a terrible place, especially when you're talking eight-man teams. Eight-man teams, it doesn't matter if one, maybe one or two armies are destroying everybody because they're only represented one or two times. You know what I mean? Like, they're one per. So you have to make strategies about it no matter what. And again, say Scar is bringing World Destroyer. He's crushing everybody with unnerved Harlequins. Well, I might have a defender list that's whole job is to hide from him and just lose by just a little bit. That's the whole point we're trying to get him into. You know, so it you can take a bad meta and make every meta kind of good, basically, uh, in a yeah, team so event. Like the eight players on your team, only one of those has to play against Harlequins. Yeah. You get, or only one has mm -hmm. to play against Nids or whatever the hotness is, rather than the eight of you go together to a singles event and round one. Cool, we're all playing Harlequins. Yeah, we're all. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. like, what was my match? It was like, 
I think the the worst meta for that was still the the not this LVO but the last LVO before COVID when I played uh, nine games and five of them were against Iron Hands, specifically the same list. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the Proliathan yeah. or whatever. I played, five, yeah. I played five of my nine games against Iron yeah. Hands. I was like... Well, that's, that just marks the difference the between, mm-hmm. like, singles events and... it's There's so many differences, right? Because in singles events, you want to make a list that can tackle Tau, like, every time, right? Or can tackle you know, Tyranids or has tools to deal with the top meta list. But in, in, in teams, because you can avoid it, like personally, I played Drukari and Tower, one of the toughest yep. matchups with Drukari in general. <laughs> you just know. I can like avoid it all weekend. 100%. I, mean, you know, they, yeah. I don't have to play it. I can play everything except Tau. It, and so uh, the pressure's off in that sense. Even before the data sheet, I, uh, I, I, for instance, going in, just won BFS team championships. And before last week, we bore the bat, and they used the the data, the bat, yeah, the balance update. It's like, yeah, yeah. So, I, even before that, I was just at that time, I was like, I'm probably going to leave this list exactly how it is because I'm just not going to play tile. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Like, what can you play? I'm like, give me a good board, and I defend it. And I go, I'm going to take a good board, and I'm not going to take tile. So when you, when you're doing your pairings, put down it, but that's a funny thing about this. We talked about pairings and things of that nature and strategies and why it's so fun because you can have armies that are specifically to bully and then put something else in. For instance, if you're attacking my Eldar, you know that I don't want to play Tau. So you put Tau and yep. something else would force that something else into that pairing. And I love the, the strategy of that. Yeah. Cause that might be one that doesn't have many of the, good matchups later on you're going cool take a bad match or take our weaker list and exactly an okay game right we'll, and, and there's and, so uh, much we can do in pairings which there, we'll cover I, I think we're even going to do some example pairings oh, as oh, well. yeah. but, we're going to go through and pairings are i think that people don't understand how much goes into pairings there's so much practice there's so much and a good team and this has happened multiple times even with uh, playing with america we've had years where we brought some misses on lists and stuff but Mm -hmm. we ended up winning rounds because we won in the pairing situation so we got better matchups than a team that just if you basically ranked each each list kind of thing would just have way better overall score than us but we got matches that worked for us yeah, and the WTC ETC has spawned some of the wackiest lists you could ever imagine. Oh, okay. You know, from three or four hundred grots all the way to three what was it, a hundred razorwing flocks or whatever it was. <laughs> like, just, but the, you know, like they're just sound kind of crazy. But when it comes to I need to be able to play the top list and make sure it doesn't win by much makes sense when you're not just trying to win you're trying to blunt the opponent's ability to score right and and so we'll be discussing list building we'll be discussing pairings over the course of the series but all in all like just that back and forth means that you can be very creative with your list building like you can have a warlord trait or a relic or a stratagem or even sort of like a a chapter trait that is specifically very niche like anti-psyker and you could build an entire army that is focused on anti-psyker so that if you fight into Grey Knights or a Thousand Sons or whatever, you can literally be funneled into that list and 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 you have all the tools you need for it, right? And it's really cool because I feel it it allows you to be more creative depending on what the rest of the team is going to do um, within the factions you I, pick. I, I love bullying into pairings too because if you have two lists that are very skewed, they can't put down their regular defender if that mm-hmm. the defender doesn't like those. Those might not even be that good into the rest of the meta, but you know that certain things are going to defend or are typical type defenders and stuff, and people can't be put down. So it actually messes with your opponent's pairings because they can't do what they want to do. They can't be in their safe zone of what I like to put this down and I put this down and this down. If you have a couple counter lists that are super heavy counter, play really well into only a few things, but one of those few things is their defender uh all of a sudden they they don't know who they're supposed to put out kind of thing you know because they're like oh my list plays amazing into everything except for knights and you guys brought two knights and i'm the usual yeah. first defender well i can't go out now because you have these two big boy lists um and then they have to change how they do things 
Yeah. yeah, I think a great example of that would be in 2019, in the every set of eight uh, heart tables has its own set of terrain, so its own layouts. And there was one board which had a medium sized ruin in the middle of the board and about four forests. And yeah, maybe a couple, that was pretty much it. That's pretty much it. It had so, a hill it had, in two hills. Yeah. <laughs> you see, mm-hmm. teams would go, you, like you said that event, you'd be like, what the hell is going on? That's awful. But in a team set up, you'd go, oh, We've got a nine broadside tile. Yep. Nine broadside tile. Mm-hmm. Our first defender wants that table. So you need to have two armies that are prepared to play against the shootiest army going uh, with nowhere to hide. Correct. So you skew that into you, your list. You, you see that so you know, much on your parents, your matrix. Teams that don't have a lot of experience are so ready, uh, especially when you look at the matrixes and they're like, we really feel good about this. But then you go, well, how do you feel about it on absolutely no terrain? Or the other mm-hmm. way around, how do you feel yeah. about it when your opponent takes the heaviest board? Because in teams, they have open board and, by the way, and a by super heavy, heavy board. Heavy. Because heavy. Uh, yeah. they, they have two skew boards on those eight yeah. boards. There's one really open. There's one unbelievably heavy. And then there's ranges of goodness, depending on the mission, of course, in the middle. But there's always going to be at least one super light and one super heavy. And you're like, well, how do you feel about taking on 40... Uh, Deathwing Terminators uh, that you can't see ever. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. They're bouncing it's from so ruin now. to ruin. Yeah. <laughs> like the, the train's a little bit more balanced across each, but it does have, like, some will have forests, some will have craters, some will have lots of big ruins, some will have lots of small ruins. So there's definitely play for picking your train, for the matchups, yep. for the armies, or picking some just to take it out the parents. I can't wait really to go through one. that. And sometimes you're just taking a match just to take the match. Like if if you come in and you guys are playing Tyrannins and old Harlequins, sometimes you're just going to pull the, the Tyrannins out, you know, and just say, I'm going to lose, but I'd like to lose by less. But also it opens up the pairing. So somebody just a lot of times just has to jump on that grenade and just go, well, you know, pull this out of the pairing. So the rest of the pairings go better. Uh, Patrick, how do you see it? I love the team event. The thing is, is that, I'm, I've never been a huge fan of, one, I hate monetization of this game, so we could argue about that all day, but um, I think the team event is the best way to look at if you were going to do it as an eSport, uh, because you could have multiple games going at the same time, uh, and you can switch between them. I think the, the uh, guys who did the ATC, uh, I feel bad about this because I should know who was running it, but uh, they had a great stream because they streamed all five games uh, the top tables and they kept yeah. bouncing between them and i think that's the most fun way to watch also because even if a game starts to become a blowout boom next game but also even in that blowout game it still makes a difference because if matt's smashing me usually in a singles game you're like okay i don't want to watch this anymore mm-hmm. but uh oh, welcome matt matt jordan new war war member uh but you you still that game might be very very integral to the overall team point because whether he beats me you know 20 0 or 15 5 could be the entire difference in whether the team wins or loses i'm still losing that game but that game still might be the deciding factor so and the thing is is that you're the players aren't allowed to talk to each other but the coaches can tell the players if they should basically push not push you know what they what they the projected score is and stuff like that yeah take a risk play it safe just some, yeah. sometimes you're like uh one game's gone horribly bad uh the rest of you guys need to take some risks and push for an extra two points a game mm-hmm. and if you've been sat just going steady 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 all of a sudden you're like um okay uh right how do i get <laughs> these extra points i just all of a sudden you have to flip the momentum yeah and that can be a real uh I get, my, one of my favorite ever I'll give you a story on this we're almost to a close but in the middle of the tournament I had been told play it safe play it safe play it safe and I'm going into my last two round, two, uh, two rounds of the game and all of a sudden a lot of games had slipped away from us so I got the advice of YOLO swag this and do it immediately <laughs> <laughs> I'm like what happened to sitting back you're like no that's code for go for it Brad. yeah, yeah, yeah. At that point, if you lose by five to ten, it doesn't matter because we're losing the round. Right. But if you can somehow pull it off, you're a hero. Exactly. Yep. So yeah. I went, 
okay, uh, let's let's set down the wine for just a second, and then, and then all, all looks like all my models are going forward now. So, yeah, absolutely massive. Now, Hugh, uh, we are going to start promoing this, but the Art of War team, um, who has uh, is going to is currently in discussion with organizers at the WTC to present some seminars on the Thursday just before the team event. Which is huge. You're gonna. We're thinking of doing some sort of like cocktail hour seminars. So you meet, greet, talk, chat. We're gonna make it an event, and uh, hopefully really looking an, forward to that. Hopefully making way. it an event for every year too. I'd like Correct. to. I'd like to do this. Yeah. We might actually move it to the Wednesday. Uh, Matt made some good points on that. Uh, so where it's yeah. gonna be either Wednesday or Thursday because a lot of time Thursday is a team team only type thing. And it may be both. Yeah, that's true. You may do a social Wednesday night because a lot of teams do go party and party hard on the Wednesday, uh, recover Thursday, game Friday, but we might do a seminar on the Thursday where the finals of the singles yep. are on and it's just like a social on the Wednesday night. But once we get details, we'll let everyone know. And yeah, if anyone's in mainland Europe, come over. There's a three day 256 player team event. You can, sorry, singles event that's on. There'll be the best players from across the world in attendance. So, Great yeah. test of. I was gonna say, I I actually forget about that because I only focus on the team. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. there's an enormous singles event that's happening there too. Mm-hmm. So, which is massive. Like, and, and we we can even talk about that at some point too. But like the, you know, and we'll talk about like you know the, the the infrastructure the countries have built about like around the WTC and how they sort of like you know foster the system right the way of playing because we've been we've alluded to it a couple of times in today's chat and i cannot wait to sort of like break it down more and teach everybody out there that's watching or have somebody like take something from it and, and apply it you know in your next games 100 percent. even the one of the biggest things right here besides show up to the socials show up to some of the seminars when you're there but for the series itself I would appreciate if everybody could go into the Discord and throw in some questions that you have, because it makes it a lot easier for us to prepare specific answers to questions as opposed mm -hmm. to trying to cover everything and and then breaking it down. So we'd like to basically hammer out whatever you really want to see, what questions you have, what you're interested in in this series. <clears throat> yeah, because I think as it gets towards the end of the series, we're going to do stuff like... Oh, look, the lists are live. Let's go through some standout lists. We'll go through some of the team pairings. That'll be dead interesting once the draw's been done uh, because you'll know who you're playing for the whole of the first day. So that'll be loads of stuff to cover then. But whatever you guys want to know of how it all works, all the little details, just let us know and we'll make sure to cover that in as much detail as possible. 100% on that. So I love it. For everyone, Matt, Mr. Scari, thanks for hanging out with me. Everyone, Absolutely. thanks for hanging out with all of us, and we will see you soon. See you guys.